and we're recording. Hey, hello everyone. I'm Kim Mack. Welcome to the 12th event in the Popular Books and Process series, a collaboration between the Journal of Popular Music Studies, IASPM US, and the Pop Conference. Two weeks ago, we had a great conversation between Ashley Khan, Holly George Warren, Anthony DeCurtis, and Mark Rowland about George Harrison. And next week on September 22nd, Alex Ross will be discussing his new book, Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. And in case you're unaware, you can find previous sessions on Eric Weisbard's YouTube channel. Today, we're excited to have Marta Gonzalez here, who will talk about her new book, Chicana Artivistas, Music, Community, and Transborder Tactics in East Los Angeles. And she will be in conversation with Mikaela Diaz-Sanchez. Marta Gonzalez is a Chicana artivista, musician, feminist music theorist, and assistant professor in the Intercollegiate Department of Chicana, Chicana O, Latina O Studies at Scripps Claremont College. Born and raised in Boyle Heights, she is a Fulbright, 2007-2008, Ford, 2012-2013, and Woodrow Wilson Fellow in 2016-2017. Her academic interests have been fueled by her own musicianship as a singer-songwriter <coughs> and for Grammy Award 2013 winning band Quetzal. Quetzal has made considerable impact in the Los Angeles Chicano music scene. The relevance of Quetzal's music and lyrics has been noted in a range of publications from dissertations to scholarly books. Their latest recording, Puentes Sonoros, Sonic Bridges, will be released on Smithsonian Folkways in the fall of 2020. In addition, Gonzalez, along with her partner, Quetzal Flores, has been instrumental in catalyzing the transnational dialogue between Chicanos and Latinas communities in the US and Jarocho communities in Veracruz, Mexico. Gonzalez has also been active in implementing the collective songwriting method in correctional facilities throughout California and Seattle, Washington. Most recently, and as a testament to the body of music and community work Gonzalez has accomplished on and off the stage, in the summer of 2017, Gonzalez's Terima Stomp Box and Apatiero dance shoes were acquired by the National Museum of American History. Her manuscript, Chicana Artivistas, Music, Community, and Transborder Tactics in East Los Angeles, came out on University of Texas Press in the summer of 2020. Gonzalez lives in Los Angeles with her husband, Queso Flores, and their 15-year-old son, Sandino. Nicalala Miquelala Diaz Sanchez was born in Albuquerque, Nuevo Mexico and raised in San Antonio, Texas. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Chicano and Chicana, Chicana and Chicano Studies at the UCSB, where she teaches Chicana art and feminism, Afro-Latina OX diasporic performance, Latina OX performance studies, and Teatro Chicano OX. She is currently working on articles focusing on gender and sexuality in the contemporary practices of Bamba, as well as an article about Chicana O cultural producers as part of the African diaspora through what she conceptualizes as Afro Chicana O diasporic aesthetics, while completing her manuscript Between Nation and Diaspora Chicana and Mexicana Feminist Performance. After the discussion, there will be a Q&A, which Eric Weisbard will moderate. Please put your questions in the chat as they come to you, and Eric will find them there at the end of the discussion. So now we'll turn things over to Marta and Michaela. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much for, um, first of all, um, for the invitation, for, I mean, for allowing this space, Eric. Thank you so much. Um, to the Journal of Popular Music Studies, the POP Conference for holding this platform in this, these times. Um, I'm honored to be able to have been given a space to, to talk a little bit about my work. And thank you, Kimberly, um, for the introduction. And um, it's encouraging to be able to continue to have dialogue around music of all kinds and communities in these spaces, um, especially when we're so far apart. Um, but it keeps our minds on things that um, sounds, the sonic landscapes that we as human beings create and uh, thrive with and through. Um, and uh, um, just remind, reminding us of our humanity in that way. Um, and thank you also to my intellectual comadre, which you will hear from shortly. This is the intellectual comadre term comes from her uh, precisely. I take that from her. Um, uh, Micaela Diaz Sanchez for taking the time out of, of her own uh, 
own writing and her own book, which will soon be out on UT Press as well, uh, for agreeing to be here today to help me discuss this book. So yes, we are here to, <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, sorry, I'm kind of nervous. I don't know why. I know this is a totally safe space and I appreciate you all being here. But um, so yes, my book is called um, Chicano Artivistas, Music, Community and Transborder Tactics in East Los Angeles. It's published on UT Austin Press um, and it's been in the making for many years now. And like many, the topic of this book is highly uh, personal. Uh, as it's directly informed by my lived experience as a musician, a uh, woman of color, a Chicana in community uh, in East, East Los Angeles, and also on many stages across the country and, and, and other countries around the world. So I think I'm going to read, I know some of you received it, but if it's okay, I'm going to read a little bit of the intro, just to, for some folks who are just coming on, and just in case nobody got to really look at some of that so I don't go off on tangents either. So I begin with the, this introduction begins with a, a quote by Gloria Zaldúa, our oftentimes um, we draw from her work as a Bible to Chicana feminist theory um, um, on all levels and in, in all art. Um, it starts with them, um, quote, we need teorías that will enable us to interpret what happens in the world, that will explain how and why we, we relate to certain people in specific ways. We need theories that will point out ways to maneuver between our particular experiences and the necessity of forming our own categories and the theoretical models for the patterns we uncover. We need theories that examine the implications of situations and look at what's behind them. That's from Borderlands La Frontera. And then I also have a quote here by Priti Ramamurti, who is an um, international econo um, economic development theorist. And she says, so the circumstances of our lives and our labor enable what we can know. I've traveled the world as a professional musician, experiencing music in many fronts, sites, and social locations has demonstrated to me that music is understood and engaged in a number of ways. I've had music experiences that as a performer were oppressive and have left imprints of shame and trauma in my memory. But there have also been moments of hope. Music in this sense was inspiring, a conduit of freedom and a malleable tool for those who envision social change. These moments in particular have allowed me to see how music could be a liberatory process, a deliberate act of love and a source of empowerment for self and community. My labor as a musician over the years enables what I know and thus what I recount and theorize in this book. It is an autoethnographic account of varied music moments experienced on a professional stage, panhandling on street corners and in the throes of community organizing amid the many struggles and deep trenches of social movement. Importantly, the varied experiences I recount and theorize in this book altered how I conceive and practice the craft at present. Most of all, it demonstrates how over time, a music practitioner like me experienced a fundamental change in philosophy. Theorizing music through an autoethnographic lens, beginning with early childhood memories, will elucidate a range of methods and social theories and transformations that happen along the way in various social settings. Drawing from post-colonial, Chicana, Black feminist and performance theory, Chicana artivistas, maps an intimate individual and community process. To this end, Chicana Artivistas is my testimonio from the musician my father raised me to be to what I have become for myself and alongside my community, an artivista or artist activist. My political coming and social coming of age in the early 1990s was shaped alongside and in conversation with other Chicano artists from East LA. Our collective experiences and dialogue prompted us to identify with Artivista as more than a political identity, but as the way in which we relate to our craft, and more specifically, how we apply our skill set in the context of a dominant capital market system. So in the book, I, I, I often oscillate between a personal narrative, testimonial, academic theory, and um, delving deep into the moments that give rise to um, 
what I focus on later on in the book are these methods, these important methods that I feel have been instrumental in, in uh, uh, getting artists and communities to think of music in new ways or ways that are not dominant in our system anyway, in our social system. Um, the narratives throughout will make visible the intersections of race, class, gender, and sexuality embedded in the push and pull of an all-encompassing globalized political economy. It is the proliferation of this system and its respective xenophobic US nationalist agenda that builds a war on migrants and on difference in all its manifestations. Its social logic isolates us from each other through its commodity culture that is inherently competitive and transactional. These lived realities and the respective resistances are corroborated, augmented, and upheld by Chicana and Black feminist theoretical frameworks, post-colonial theory, US third world economic development theory, ethnomusicology, and performance studies. In this way, this study is an academic theorization of a music practitioner's memories and how transformative lived experience changes one's conceptions of music over time. Um, so the book then goes on to describe great lengths um, my father's influence in music um, and how his, uh, um, his way of teaching us about music practice is really rooted in Mexico's modernity project that he grew up in. Um, I talk about the East LA Latino music and art movement. And I think I, I won't go too much into this because I feel that Micaela and I will probably engage in a conversation um, regarding these different moments in the book um, um, where I uh, talk about the respective spaces that give rise to these ideas and to these practices like the Popular Resource Center um, in the 90s in Los Angeles, which is non-existent now, but was very important and informative to a number of artists that are still thriving today. Um, Troy Cafe as well. Um, um, the influence that the Zapatista uprising had on the East Los Angeles art movement, um, the historic Encuentro that happened in 1997, Encuentro Cultural Chicano Indígena por la Humanidad y Contra el Neoliberalismo, um, the Fandango movements. Um, my own experiences along the way, of course, are described on the, um, as a member of the group Quetzal. Um, and and more, most importantly, I think, in what I value, I value all of how um, this book really maps an intimate and a um, look, of course, at music in, in my life, but I think it's overall, the macro look is really a critique on capitalism and how it has fundamentally altered how we think of ourselves as creative beings and uh, um, how we, how, and how that intrinsically affects how we relate to each other as communities. Um, and uh, um, part of what helps us undo this, in my opinion, and as I express in the book, is these community practice that, practices and methods that come from a lot of these lessons learned and that I describe more fully later on in the book. And um, um, these practices give way to these methods that are beginning, that are being implemented to this very day and under various contexts. And I'd like to share some of these vid, uh, via some video clips so that I'm not just reading. Is that okay? Can I show some? All right. Okay, so I'm gonna show you um, um, some of the ways in which Artivista practices and methods um, have been utilized um, that I described throughout, um, but have been utilized as of present, right? How uh, these experiences um, sort of transformed our way of thinking about music and how we're applying them now. I hope you can see this. Okay, can you see this? All right, so we're gonna start with this one. One of the things I mentioned in the book is this idea of the collective songwriting method, which we really experienced first in this 1997 Encuentro with Zapatista or the Mayan rebels in Chiapas, Mexico. Um, we experienced with them. Over the years, we've um, refined this method and have been applying it in different contexts. So I'm just gonna show a small piece of this video here. Thank you. 
all working at this nexus, this kind of cross-sectoral place of what is systems change and community organizing and what is traditional arts practice. And one of the, you know, the ongoing conversations that we're having is a lot about process versus product. You know, and they're not mutually exclusive. But I think we've seen, you know, that, that this collective songwriting process is, is exactly that, is a process and that there is a commitment to the dialogue, to it being open, to everyone having a voice and not censoring what's said. Um, and then out of that emerges this collective song, collective vision, and then collective action. ACTA being a traditional arts organization is charged with implementing and integrating and interfacing traditional arts and cultures into the broad scope of what community health looks like via the Building Healthy Communities Collaborative. The three work groups we've been interfacing with are the Health Happens in Neighborhoods, Health Happens with Prevention, and Health Happens in Schools. One of the, the tools that we've been accessing uh, as a resource in the community is collective songwriting. Danos uh, el derecho de poder escoger la forma de, de cómo trabajar con nuestra juventud. Collective songwriting really brings the community in to do the work of music. It really brings them in to, to engage in that process. And by having them be a part of that process gives them a sense of ownership to the ideas to the discussions that are taking place while they're creating music um, as a way of articulating something beyond what's written on paper or what's being suggested by somebody else. This is something that music allows them to create for themselves. And I think that that has been the most powerful thing to witness in every one of these spaces. This event was marvelous to illuminate you because it illuminated me to be a composer of songs. Fue algo muy divertido, expresivo, en donde podemos transmitir sobre el arte, sobre la educación, sobre nuestros derechos. Y esto mismo que aprendimos vamos a transmitirlo a nuestros hijos y a nuestra comunidad. We've had workshops on DACA DAPA and Deferred Action. We've had workshops on local control funding formula. We've had workshops on Boyle Heights for Youth and Youth Advocacy in general. We've had workshops on Prop 47 and, and the, uh, reduced sentencing. We've had uh, workshops on restorative justice. So we've done a, a lot of work uh, and, and put a lot of, uh, have invested a lot of time and energy into this idea of collective songwriting. The band Quetzal and individual artists that are part of that collective have really been working from a place of deep heritage and community aesthetics and values um, and exploring a lot of different kinds of music and also a process that is part of all kinds of traditional arts, a process that's rooted in community. And so from that emerges Quetzal's collective songwriting methodology, which is very hand in glove with traditional arts processes. And so it was very natural evolution for ACTA to, to really to be able to take advantage of these artists who have a lot of experience in this methodology and to bring that to a larger scale in Boyle Heights. Collective songwriting as a method and the ways in which um, Chicano Artivista is implemented in community has a, a roots in the Zapatista movement. The Zapatista movement is a movement that really identifies um, autonomy and self-determination uh, for communities in struggle. A group of, of, of Chicano artists, activists, went to Chiapas and studied these methods and the musicians studying these Zapatista methods developed the collective songwriting method. Along with a very important figure in the movement, uh, and her name is Rosa Marta Zarate. This is coming out of a Chicano tradition, Chicano community that has been uh, doing art and activism for now for many decades. It's part of the ethos, part of the, the, the fabric of the Chicano community. And so collective songwriting has, has now become a very important piece of that fabric that uh, not only 
establishes a space where a community can have a conversation through the composition of a song, but that artists themselves have a space at the table for social justice and organizing. All right. So I'm looking at the time and I wanted to share um, a two other clips, but I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's just one example of some of the methodology that I discuss in the book. Um, the other one is the Fandango, um, which is a participatory music and dance practice native to the state of Veracruz and the different ways that um, the communities here um, have been implementing this practice uh, to reach across uh, other groups such as, such as Japanese American communities and, and um, and um, African-American communities in Los Angeles. Um, and so it's just a, a small window of what I'm attempting to do in this book. It's my first book. And uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Diaz Sanchez, Micaela, if you wanna take it away. <laughs> sure. Um, thank you so much to Marta and for the invitation. And, um, and Eric, it's good to, to meet you and it's good to see so many familiar faces uh, again, it's truly an honor to um, to be part of this conversation. I also want to um, acknowledge some of our um, uh, scholars in the room, Michelle Abel Payan, Olga Najera Ramirez, right? And so if we think about, um, right, uh, Chicana feminist theory is sort of those kinds of intellectual genealogies that Marta really roots her her work in, right? These are some scholars on, on whose shoulders we are um, standing and, and inspired by. So thank you for your work, um, Michelle and Olga. Um, and I think that that's what's so extraordinary about uh, this book is that speaking of sort of like these kind of intellectual genealogies that this book really is about multiple genealogies of of your thinking, Marta, your clearly your, your most literal genealogy that you begin with, the most personal point of entry, which is your father, um, your genealogy as a, as a musician, um, and also um, as a scholar, right, you sharing some of those really informative and formative moments of, you know, being in the UCLA uh, ethnomusicology right um, program and, and being exposed to these really fundamental fundamentally um, you know uh, influential scholars who shifted the notion of music not as a thing but as a mode of analysis or music as a way for us to 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 create knowledge right not just sort of as an object of study right um, and so and and also again your your um, your uh, genealogy as a as a feminist thinker and you know of course you know beginning with uh, with Anzaldúa, um, right, really as the direct point of entry into the text, really positions us to, to really think about the, the, the book as the Chicana feminist text. And so my sort of first question, right, is especially, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, riffing off of what you just showed us in terms of the, the example of what collective songwriting looks like. And, you, and, and, and you, you do talk about how collective songwriting in and of itself as a methodology or as a knowledge making practice challenges patriarchal systems, right? And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more um, about how this practice of collective songwriting in and of itself um, you know, you, 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 you see how, how, I, how it operates um, as, um, as, again, challenging these patriarchal systems that are, again, rooted in, in you know, commodity and um, in ways in which, uh, you know, music is commercialized, is quantified, right, in ways that do not respect process. Um, and so if you could just sort of talk about, again, I'm really fascinated um, uh, by how you think about collective, because it's collective songwriting, but it's like collective knowledge making as a feminist practice that challenges patriarchal systems. Um, so I'll throw that out there. And then again, as Eric said, you know, those uh, for people who are on the call, please, um, please, uh, you know, uh, include your questions in the chat here and we'll, we'll stop uh, at about, um, three uh, Pacific Standard Time to, to um, open it up to people who have questions. But again, please note those questions. So that's my first, um, that's my first kind of question. I also, I have many, many questions, um, but maybe we could start there, Marta. Sure. So if I understand, um, so what, um, okay, process. 
so for me, this idea of, you know, what, I, what I'm writing about, as you mentioned, is not so much, yeah, an analysis on actual product, right, of music analysis or, um, um, I'm really trying to focus on what process feels like, what it looks like, what, how else music can help us reach a kind of um, a new way of analysis, summit into new analyses, right? And how we can do this in collective ways, right? So much of our culture is based on, on products, right? We, and our concept of how we grow up thinking about music in our world and in our society is really rooted in, um, yeah, commodity culture, right? You buy or you sell music. And with rare exceptions, um, perhaps the church, churches and uh, contra dances, some cultures that are still intact, um, um, is it really a process, right? A way of just being in community with music and doing music as community, right? Um, and so part of the urgency that we have had as Chicano Artivistas, which is informed by the Zapatista movement, as well as other movements, uh, transnational, uh, translocal movements like the Fandango movement, is this idea that music can also be much more than that, right? Music, um, um, that human beings have been robbed of this concept in many ways, and especially in capitalist societies, right? That music is, um, is something that we should all do. It's a human right to be creative and be creative beings, right? And you don't have to professionalize to enjoy music right, to be a part of a community that practices music. Um, so in this way, we realize that to center process is extremely important, um, not just, uh, again, to reach new, some new ideas and analysis, which always lead to that. And I can show you other clips of how this works. And one other clip that I'd like to share in answering this question, right? Um, but it's also um, process fundamentally challenges. When we focus on process rather than product, it fundamentally challenges what um, Bell Hooks calls white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, right? Um, and um, um, product, because product is disembodied, right? Product is not, is not process, right? Um, um, process centers humanity, centers dialogue, centers convivencia. What we mention a lot is, and we use a lot is convivencia. Convivencia is a term that it's, um, to live with, but really it's really presence of mind and being in each other's company in a way that is uh, very much rooted in music practice, music and participatory music and dance practice, but also in, in being really um, present to each other, right? Um, there have been a number of scholars who have talked about the important work that this does, um, right? Uh, how communities, um, bond, build, are critical of other ways. And um, one of the things that we've realized over the years is that this process, that many cultures have this kind of process in their archival cultural memory banks, right? So for example, I'm gonna uh, just share, uh, if, if I can, a, a short clip of, of, um, of one of the things that Fandango, for example, has done a participatory music and dance practice native to the state of Veracruz um, and how we have connected with other groups across um, Los Angeles um, to do just that, right? To come to dialogue, to um, build community across um, cultures and, and space, right? So let me just, um, oh goodness. This is um, called Fandango. <laughs> Fandango Obon is a gathering of three distinct cultures, the West African and the Obonodori, which is Japanese Buddhist traditions. And this is our third year, and each year the circle is getting more and more diverse. As long as the energy is really good, it's a very simple to collaborate. And you know, everyone has their own instruments from wherever their country is. They all have the same roots when you really think about it. Fandango, Obon, 
polycultural remix, Jamming a Prayer, Angelino Souls, Transforming Ethnic Borders, Birthing a New World. We're building an idea that it's a good thing for people of different cultures to come together and to convene in a way that's maybe unusual actually because they actually get to participate in another form that's uh, different from theirs but then they can also see, oh, you know, there's similarities about this too. We want people to feel comfortable crossing borders into other communities. It don't matter who you are or what you do in your life. If you walk down that street and you see all these people right here doing this beautiful thing, oh, I swear <laughs> you're, you're gonna, gonna wanna it. jump you're in. You're gonna feel it. Yeah. example process <laughs> I hope I answered your question <laughs> yeah they're, like, they're all so um related and you know um is they, yeah I have I also have a, a thank you so much for for sharing that and what a beautiful you know testament to the spirit of collaboration and um and you know really thinking about right what makes a lot I mean because the I also feel like this book is such a love letter to Los Angeles, especially East Los Angeles, right? And so, you know, a real testament to the ways in which maybe only this could happen in Los Angeles, right? Like that kind of cultural convergence and critical dialogue around these um, embodied practices. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And I was, uh, it was an honor. To, I happened to be at the Smithsonian Heritage Festival when y'all were, were, were performing there. So that was such an honor. Um, and the way, you know, again, the, when, for those of you who haven't read the book, you really do go on a journey with Marta. She describes all of these formative um, experiences in terms of her own thinking as a, again, as a, a scholar, as a feminist, as a mother, as a partner. Um, and so I kind of two questions um, that may or may not be related. But um, my first question is like, uh, you know, because you at many moments during the book, you also address this sort of uh, you address this question of not romanticizing the process, right? That there are bumps in the road that we need not really think about this again uh, a seamless kind of process of community collaborative collective, right? And you describing those <laughs> those experiences in in the of of you know being robbed and all of these kinds of experiences that are just a real part of of what it means to collaborate across um, you know national borders but so I so I have a question about you know what were some of the challenges that that you had in writing the book or that you know maybe writing the book made you think about in a different way I was really struck by a sentence that you have on the first page that you read to us about your fundamental change in philosophy and I'm curious about what that is so I'll, I'll put an asterisk by that one um, but so yeah, so what were the cha some some challenges that you had um, in conceptualizing the book, in doing the research, gathering the information? Um, and another thing that I really want to acknowledge about uh, about Marta's book is that um, she names people, right? <laughs> she names all of these people who she worked with, right? This is not sort of this kind of um, uh, you know single authored, right? I you know. Um, a sort of notion of you know uh, that it is and, set, and, and so the, the notion of collective songwriting is embodied as it can be as it, much as it can be in a text but the, the way that you name people right name people who are graduate students or community members people who had children people who were sick people who you know but people who contributed to this collective um, a body of, of knowledge and also of knowledge making um, so I'm kind of curious about some of the challenges. And then my other question, if we 
do have time, I know you might want to show some more clips so we can kind of put it in the parking lot. But uh, as my and many of us in the room in the zoom room um, are also teachers. Right. So I'm kind of curious about how the sort of uh, this work also informs your work in the classroom, right? Like what are the kind of pedagogical implications uh, of the work that you're doing? So I kind of threw a lot at you, but I guess the first question really um, is uh, the sort of the challenges in, in conceptualizing the book and writing the book, because um, I know it has been sort of a decades long process, right? That you've been thinking about the projects. Right. Well, the book is a project, yes. Uh, it's been a number of years, uh, but living it um, is, much longer, right? I know, like I know, I look like I'm 20, but really, I'm almost. Just kidding. Ha <laughs> ha! Everybody laughs, and I don't know whether to take that as an insult or. And I, I'm kidding. No. Okay, so um, yes, lived experience, quite a bit of time. Um, I think over the years, and having lived not just in the early 70s, um, in the mid to late 70s, the variedad circuit, that circuit, that circuit, circuit that um, inserted us into, um, as well as, you know, the Zapatista movements in Los Angeles um, in the mid 90s, um, then the Fandango uh, sort of movement when it first started and just getting all that uh, here in Los Angeles going as well as in Seattle, Washington, all of these moments, I think that um, were very important, right? Uh, changed my perspective in fundamental ways. Um, but I wasn't thinking, of course, as an academic or that one day I need to write a book, right? Um, I think getting to grad school and having um, mentors such as, first of all, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned this earlier and in my nervousness, I failed to, to mention, um, uh, both Olga Najera Ramirez as well as Michelle Habel Payan. Um, but somebody else who is not here is Steven Losa. And I mentioned this early on that Steven Losa at, um, as well in, at UCLA first telling me that what I had lived as far as the 70s and the Variedad circuit in Los Angeles was important and that I needed to really um, bring my experience to UCLA. And then later as a member of Quetzal and I'm being on stage and doing what I did uh, creatively as an artist on this wooden box um, to have professors like uh, Dr. Anajera Ramirez tell me, Marta, you should write about what you do on that box. What is it that you do, you know? And, um, and I, I wrote a first piece for her actually. And she, that piece helped me get into grad school. Um, and then once I was in grad school, um, which by the way, she edited the hell out of it, which I thought was wonderful. And I thought, and it was still fun. And then I realized, hey, grad school may be for me. Okay. So then um, it was still fun to write. And, uh, and, then, I, and then I get to, um, I'm at a gig and I meet Michelle Habel Payan, who then says, hey, I teach your music in my class. And uh, by then I had met not just Professor Najera Ramirez, but other scholars who were writing about our work um, as, you know, and analyzing lyrics and our, the music that we made and stuff like that. But um, um, Michelle Habel Payan really was really, um, when I mentioned to her that I might want to go back to school, she said, come to the University of Washington. And the rest is kind of history. She's been my, um, my intellectual mom in many respects. Um, to this very day and um, it's been collaborative as well right she'd always push me to to stay honest about what i was doing um, said that the work that i did and what i had lived was important to write about and document and to theorize around and with every class that i took um, i think that um, the theories were always sort of disembodied or uh, with rare exceptions um, and of course every time I took a Chicana feminist studies course or uh, Africana studies course um, it was all there it all made sense and so um, I realized that there was a lot there and it was uh, worth the mention and at least a, a way of, of one story of, of many from Los Angeles that could possibly be useful to future generations and um, and so that's what I ended up doing. You know, it's a lot of encouragement from different Chicana feminist scholars and Black feminist scholars um, that I just um, their theoretical frameworks um, were very helpful in helping me shape what ended up becoming the book. Um, and um, so I think the difficult part is is trying not 
it is centered a lot around my experience or the change of music conception over time. Um, the difficult part was sort of um, trying not to focus it so much on myself and really um, getting at what what were important about these moments, right? What I I drew from them, and the kinds of things that they challenged, right? My my from early beginnings into the present, and so. Um, anyhow, that's I'm not quite sure if I answered. Um, and yes, and in terms of collaboration, you know, I think that um, work that was created out of a lot of these experiences, like the Fandango um, community, and feeling so. Uh, lonely in Seattle, Washington, for example, being away from the LA community, um, the Fanda Seattle Fandango project was born out of these practices. I didn't think I would write about that either, but it became very relevant as I began to write more and more. Um, and um, a lot of the folks are on this call, um, um, people like Yesenia Hunter, who's on this call as well, and uh, who is now a PhD student in the history department at USC. Um, as well as um, um, Iris Viveros is not here, but there's people that have been, um, that know and have, um, I, I believe that these practices have fundamentally um, also reached them in the ways that they reached me. And they're on their own amazing path. And I'm so proud to know them and to have collaborated with them in the Seattle Fandango project. Uh, Professor Abel Payan has also started the Women Who Rock project. Um, that is also related to the convivencia ethics and value systems that are espoused in Fandango and collective songwriting. Um, and, you know, she can say more about that. But um, again, the, the work itself is process, continues to be process, and there are other spin offs um, sort of that have happened as a result and that continue to happen. Uh, I don't know if you want, I don't know if you want to show another clip before we have about 15 more minutes, but I know that you said there might be another clip that you want to show or, um, or if not, the other question I had was about um, pedagogy, right? And how, again, many of us in the room are, are teachers. And so how, you know, how do you envision the sort of methodologies that you lay out for us? Where you going to go? Were you going to Sorry. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> uh, that you lay out first in the book how you know how we can um how you see how you envision great because we, we we write these or you know you, you you conceptualize the book and you think about how it's going to be interesting but and you know and informative but also how can it be useful in the classroom or for those of us who you know are teaching especially at these critical moments when we're having to um you know where, where, where we can't be with our students but yet we're having to um, you know, to discuss and interrogate all of these questions about, um, you, know, uh, you know, racial violence, um, uh, inhumane uh, access to healthcare, climate change, all of these, um, all of these challenges that we're dealing with um, in, 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 you know, in relationship to our students. So that I have a question sort of about pedagogy and how that, um, yeah. All right. Okay. okay. Well, well, this is, a, this is a, a great question and it's, because um, it makes me want to show you this next clip. Um, but I will show it, but I am gonna say this much. Um, what I've been utilizing a lot in my classroom as well, as you'd all know, the state of the world and society is really um, thick, right? Uh, very uh, uh, tense. And um, I'm not proposing that music will be like the kumbaya to like, you know, like we're all gonna, it's all gonna be harmonious. But I am saying that because it is music, like for example, in the collective songwriting method, right? Because it is music and because I, I, I do everything from discuss readings to um, discuss like as the clip showed, Daka Dapa or Proposition 47 or, you know, um, uh, the LCFF um, funds, right? Um, all of these ways in which I'm trying to get community to really discuss these things, right? We can easily invite them to a meeting and we can talk at them, right? But we have come to find that in our communities, this is not something that, the, first of all, they're talked at consistently, right? Um, and we want more feedback, we want dialogue to happen, right? And oftentimes the, um, the power, the legal power or, or the legal language is so um, oppressive, right, to certain communities. And so my, my goal always is to come in and, and be able to say, vamos a escribir una canción. We're gonna write a song right now, using my skill set as a musician, right, saying, 
that we're going to write a song, everybody, this is what it's going to be about. This is what we've realized. This is what LCFF is. This is what we're, and as you saw in the clip, there's community members describing what they want for their communities, what they want for their students, what they want, right? And so I'm utilizing this method right now in class to discuss race, to discuss class, right? To discuss the new world they want to see, right? Or to simply discuss a book chapter, right? Um, we are about to embark on Blues Legacies, Black Feminism, right, Angela Davis. And we're gonna write a song as we discuss this book. What are the important tenets? What's the thesis? What is the, you can write a song about anything, right? And so um, using uh, music, right? So when this happens, or when we're personal or when we're open it up to book chapters or are deeply personal, folks all, always experience, uh, um, first of all, they give their testimony, right? how they relate to the book, right? A testimony or testimonio is extremely important for, for marginalized communities because nobody ever asks students or, uh, or, or what they think, right? Maybe students in college, yes, but let's say other communities, right? What they think, what they want, right? For, uh, for the future, for their students or whatever the subject matter may be. Um, when you give your testimony, you always have a witness, right? The other people in the room. When people are witnessing your testimony, that becomes a healing process, right? There's a kind of healing process that can possibly happen. And from that healing process and the dialogue that happens as we're building these lyrics um, or trying to formulate a song um, through phrases, through words, um, a debate on words sometimes, right? you oftentimes towards the end of it and as you're building and you have a melody and you have suddenly everybody singing the song together then you realize you become community right it, suddenly there's a sense of community in the room um and um in the end the song is not so much like a song all right let's go record it we can sell this we get big time we're gonna be big time it's not about that it's really about um it becomes the archive and what I always like to point to is like, look, this is really great that we came up with something, but the most important thing has been the process we engaged in. Think about how we dialogued about these uh, topics, right? And so I'm always trying to point out the process. I wanna quickly show um, this uh, clip of a, a collective songwriting workshop we did in uh, a juvenile detention center in, in um, King County uh, in Seattle. Um, and so I'm going to show this very quickly. And the first thing you're going to see is the beginning, just so you get the sense of the space. And then I'm going to fast forward to the very end where you're going to see um, what they came up with when we did a five day, um, five day visit. We came up with three songs. Can you hear this? No, darn. What's going on? Hang on one second. I'm sorry. Something's going on with the sound. No, oh, you have to be able to hear the sound. What is going on? Can you see my screen? Let me get out of this again. Sorry about that. Stop share. Maybe I will not share computer sound just to see what happens. Sorry about that. Um, I think you had muted something when you heard sound coming out of your computer before. Oh, there we go. Can you hear that? Did you just hear that? Okay, sorry. Let's try this. I'm recycling my bad ways to make some better days. It's a recycling world. Again, nice, nice and loud. I'm recycling my bad ways. It's a recycling world. And when we're recording, don't come over here listening, okay? We'll listen to that afterwards. All right, so we came up with this. Sorry. Trying to beat the case, looking at my mama's basement. 
tears in her eyes Asking God why did he do this to me This is playing like a movie Stuck in the sand trying to find another plan I'm not gonna be that fun man kicking that can I'm trying to be a grown man Handle my priorities as a young teen minority When I'm in the game, you can't shine like me Cause everybody's not the same My dreams is like never in the rain If you took a couple steps in my shoes, you would feel my pain Life full of crime, a lot of things in my mind Team likes getting took, so I'm trying to refrain The dirty stuff is the place from where I came Trying to make a living, can't hold Trump change Cops killing off African Americans It's a cold world that we're living in Can't take it, so you know I find different ways to claim life So I gotta get it in That's rougher than the verbs To read his lace And people moving birds Big homie die Little homie in the herd I guess you could say That's recycling at his words I ain't talking paper And I ain't talking glass I'm talking about the future I ain't speaking about the past So And If you listen to those lyrics If you read them uh, These students are talking about recidivism they're talking about, you know, their very personal uh, um, writings that they shared with others. Um, yeah, it's just, um, it's one of those things that I feel uh, this process is, has been very important and um, helping these conversations along and um, again, reaching new ways of, of analysis because we're utilizing uh, something like music. Thank you for sharing that. I know um, Eric uh, has said, uh, for those of you who have questions, please put them uh, in the chat. And again, you know, just, you know, reflecting on what you said, Marta, uh, early on about, you know, it being a human right to be creative, you know, and the ways in which, right, the, the idea, you know, especially for, you know, first generation college students, right, the idea of going to school to be an artist, does it all make sense because right that's not how you make money right and so this kind of the pragmatism of of the ways in which um uh, we value or we don't value uh you know art not as a commodity but uh, again as a knowledge um making practice you know so again i want to thank you for for reminding us um about that as a yeah. fundamental human right and I just want to say that this is not to say that we need to get rid of all the performers or they don't know what they're doing or, or it's all wrong. It's all been wrong. I'm not saying that performative culture or people that dedicate their entire lives to the craft. And of course, we have so many geniuses in our history, right? I think that's really important. There's a value system. There's a value system and a world for that, right? What I'm advocating for is that our, an, active, an active effort into creating the the to um, revisiting the ciphers, uh, creating Fandango communities. Maybe Fandango isn't your thing, right? Maybe it's something else, right? But for us to begin to fathom our world or to be very deliberate about the new world we want to see and make sure that that world includes things like a participatory music and dance practices as a way of, 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 and proof that we have healthy communities, right? that our communities are healthy, that we are interacting in these important ways. Um, so that commodity culture isn't the only thing that we do, right? It's not the most important thing that we live, right? That it doesn't define all of who we are, right? And, uh, and I think that, I think 
if we had that, I truly believe that we would have less mental health, um, that perhaps we could um, have new ways of, of uh, more cross-cultural collaboration, right? Uh, different groups coming together in ways that we didn't, have never really um, uh, been deliberate about perhaps, right? Um, so I just think that there's, uh, there is space in our social world for these kinds of practices. And I think we, if we don't have them, if they're not there, we can research in our, our cultural archives or we can invent them. I really believe that we should invent these processes as well. Yeah, I, I just want to say something about that clip about the juvenile detention center and so how important it was, you know, that, 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 that it, going into that center was part of a larger movement in Seattle, right, that was trying to get the detention center shut down. And thank God, the new detention center that was being built and fought, even though it was built, it is not going to be used. So that as a detention, juvenile detention center. So that's a huge win in Seattle for all those young people that would have been incarcerated in that center. And so I think that it is so, just to say that, yeah, that music is not outside of these struggles, that music is deep in the struggles, right? It, it's, it can be, or if the intention is there. So I think, yeah, <laughs> we, to just open up that to the students that we're teaching, those of us who are teaching to understand that it's also about the power of music Yes, for one way can be to make a living for some people who are very, very lucky and the stars align, but it can be used for so many different things, right? And especially for building that world that we are trying to live in that does not have incarceration facilities for young people or for undocumented people, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Michelle. There, there's, um, thank you, Michelle, um, so much for all, for all of your, again, for all of your work. and. Um, it's, a, it's an incredible honor to be, I'm seeing, you know, Maria de la Rosa here, Yesenia, of course, right, people who are, again, uh, you know, on the ground um, as practitioners who, and scholars who are, you know, again, navigating all the contradictions of what it means to be a scholar and also a practitioner and also an activist and also an artivista, right? And I also appreciate that uh, in your book, Marta, about, you know, you address these kinds of contradictions, right? Like you... You address the the mess the messiness of of you know demystifying the process of of again um, acknowledging um, our impulses to romanticize a tradition, right? You know, and what, you know, like when I teach Son Harocho or Bomba or these different traditions in the class, I say, well, the reason why we're able to talk about them today is because they've had to change, right? That's that's why we can talk about them today because they've had to change. And the thing is, right, this sort of notion of um, uh, authenticity or tradition is like sometimes nails on a chalkboard, right? Because, you know, again, it, it sort of locks them in a static kind of, um, a, a static uh, a state. Um, so we have a couple of questions. I don't know if I should turn it over to Kim or, oh, okay, okay. okay. Oh, Eric's back on. He had it. Yeah, I'll, I'll... But you're doing great. So, and I feel like you may, um, if you want to um, field the questions for a couple of minutes, that's totally cool. Okay, well, there's a question from Franklin Bruno, who, the question for Marta, um, I'd like to ask a question about Professor Gonzalez's relationship to Claremont and the Inland Empire. Hi, just to expand, I didn't know until I read your bio that, that that's where you're, um, that where you're teaching. I'm, I'm from the area, I went to Pomona, I have a long relationship with KSBC, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say, uh, I'm always very interested in what people uh, see as the particulars of doing whatever work they do in in your case this kind of community work uh, in in Claremont in particular and how you see if there's anything particular about um, that uh, the, the communities uh, there uh, that 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 you've you've found to be useful to think about or that you can talk about yeah thank you uh, thank you for your um Mr. Bruno, uh, I really, uh, you know, it took me, I have to tell you the truth, it took me a while to really uh, um, reach in and around that area because it is very, um, the five C's are very isolating, or the seven C's now, right? It can be very isolating and they, they're, uh, they don't often uh, welcome people from the outside, right? It's, it could be very, um, um, sort of not very welcoming uh, 
to outside community members. But what I have done lately is really, um, first of all, there was there's a group there called Uncommon Good. Have you heard of Uncommon Good? They're okay. They're behind the Methodist Church, actually, kind of by Trader Joe's. I don't know. And so they have a wonderful um, uh, sort of uh, college prep program for um, immigrant youth and families in that area. And I've started working with them. Um, and before the pandemic, we had a whole project scheduled and it didn't uh, go through, but um, just to find that community was very uh, rewarding and not to mention to get to know sort of the area and the kind of uh, history that was there, the communities that have been slowly sort of pushed out to make more space for the colleges. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of professors there that have taken on projects that really map that, that old, the old communities um, and uh, get students to really think about that. So I think that I need to do a better job of reaching out in the, in the, in the close vicinities. But for us, I think uh, because I'm, I teach for the Intercollegiate Chicano Latino Studies Department, I'm working with students that are across the different colleges and just trying to sort of have a cohesive sort of community amongst ourselves in the colleges is, I have found it challenging in and of itself. Um, but I think that the goal is really to, um, you know, really reach closer to Pomona as well, um, uh, perhaps Riverside, right? But um, with the exception of Uncommon Good, I haven't really um, worked with many communities there. I often just try to get my students to come out to Los Angeles. You know, I teach courses in Chicano music, for example. I'm like, let's get the hell out of Claremont. Let's go to LA, East LA right here. Take the train, come all the way. I'll meet you at Union Station, you know? And so that's been really fun, you know, just to kind of get them out. And they seem to enjoy that a, a whole lot. Um, they can tell me more about that area than I, I could ever <laughs> tell them, right? Since I, I still live in Los Angeles, so. Yeah, but I need to do a better job of, of connecting in that area. I was just interested in how, I mean, there's a, as you say, there's a very complicated relationship between the colleges and the region, culturally, socioeconomically, everything. So I just wanted to see where you, where you were with that. So thank you. Um, now that I can hear again, I'm noticing Michelle um, on the chat site asking about the three roots of Fandango. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, Michelle knows the question to that. Um, is that Michelle Hegel Payan or some another Michelle? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the, there, that's been a wonderful thing to sort of communicate to different students across uh, wherever it is that we're sharing this practice with. And that is that there's, there, uh, it's Spanish, of course, Andalusian, um, as well as, um, uh, is the indigenous to the area, which is usually Popoluca and other groups um, in the regional uh, Veracruz area, Huasteca region um, as well, parts of it. And then there's an African root, right? Which is part of what this movement really advocated for. And that is in the late seventies, groups such as Mono Blanco, for example, were very adamant in making sure that not just to reinstate this practice as a, as a community practice and not just a genre, but also to really get us to think about the race involved, right? That there were black roots in this music, in the rhythms, in the form in and of itself. There's a lot of call and response, for example, right? Um, and uh, that was one of their biggest um, sort of pushes that, that both the Mexican nation state and um, whoever decides to learn it from here on out, they understand all three roots and how important they are to recognize and, um, in order to challenge, right, these ideas of race um, and racism that exist in Mexico as well as they do all over the world, really. I, I wanted to ask you a question about your relationship to academia and even more specifically, your relationship to academies, to theory, to the, because at the very beginning, you in your introduction, there was a parallel between you talking about theory as a way of navigating the world and being an artivista as, as a way of navigating the craft of making song. And so I'm interested in how you see yourself as an academic, how your uses of theory are part of that or not part of that. In other words, just how you situate yourself in relationship to this mound of stuff that's out there. Yeah. Well, I think it's been done. Uh, the road has been paved for me. Um, and I think that they probably um, had to um, knocked 
uh, you know, sort of clear the path for so many. And to begin with, Gloria Anzaldúa was one, that one um, academic, uh, well, some people may not think she's an academic, uh, you know, she was denied um, um, a degree and actually got it uh, posthumously, if I understand correctly, if I remember correctly. But, um, you know, she really paved the way for a lot of us, right? Um, and what we come to see as also in Bell Hooks as a poet, right? Um, um, other um, activists slash academics that I feel I really took from, right? Um, to think about how artists themselves, we theorize as it were already. If you ever listen to a Quetzal album, there's all kinds of theory in it. <laughs> you know, I have a song early on that I was made fun of by an academic recent, a long time ago because we had a song called The Social Relevance of Public Art. That's literally a title of one of our songs and they would crack up and they say, you should go to grad school. And little did they know years later I did, right? But songwriters are theorists, right? You right. all are songwriting uh, geniuses. I mean, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, music writers, critics, um, academics, and you know this, right? You, you use, you begin your academic um, essays oftentimes with quotes from songs, right? Uh, they, they underline, highlight what your overall academic treaties and what you go into, right? It's the same thing. I think that songwriters and artists, we can theorize for ourselves as well, um, drawing from others, and then we can also sort of um, you know, we do, we pretty much do the same thing. Um, I'm not saying that it wasn't difficult to sort of, you know, advocate for myself in the kinds of things I was talking about in my graduate studies, but I feel I'm one of the lucky ones that had, again, very supportive committee that maybe at times thought I was a little crazy and thought I should be more academic than other times, but for the most part, um, what really helped in a lot of ways was the fact that they experienced firsthand the Fandango, for example, in Seattle, Washington. If it wasn't for the actual embodied experience, they, I don't think I would have been able to convince them as much how important these things were, right? Let's say, if I could talk about collective songwriting till I'm blue in the face, but had you not seen these videos, maybe you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Blah, 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 right? So video <laughs> and actual embodied experience has been very helpful for me as a teacher. And the fact that I'm able to do that, right? That I can play and I can in class and I make them go through this process and they're like, oh shit, this was really fun. You still need the skill set of a musician, but maybe the frame of mind of, of, of an artist, but also an academic getting, him, getting them from point A to point Z, right? In all of the different ways and you want that we build lesson plans, right? So I would say that all of these worlds and these hats are working at once. And it's, um, it's sometimes it's exhausting, but always generative in, a, in the sense that my, my spirit is always full. Thank you. What a great answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, so rich and, and so many parts to that. Um, your friend, Michelle, our friend, Michelle, has another, has another <laughs> question. Um, is there such a thing as sun theory as opposed to song theory, or is that a typo? Well, sun theory, sun. yeah. Oh, theory so, of sun, I see, okay. Yes, so I use that term in a, the chapter in one of my book, in the book, in one of my books, I'm already projecting, I'm gonna write lots of books! Uh, no, okay. Um, uh, in one of the uh, chapters, I talk about the Entre Mujeres Project, which is a transnational, uh, um, music composition project that we did with women involved in the Fandango movement in Veracruz, Mexico, and women in Los Angeles, Chicana Latinas in Los Angeles. And so part of what I talk about is that, you know, because we were creating lyrics together and, you know, theorizing around everything from motherhood to broken hearts and birthing process, like, I mean, we wrote about all kinds of stuff that I call these sung theories, right? The ways in which uh, we as mothers, women, um, you know, how many songs can you think of that talk about the actual birthing process, right? And I had one woman say like, I want to talk about what it feels like to have that baby move inside my belly. And I was like, oh shit, is that going to be catchy? Like what kind of thing could we ever do? No, but it nevertheless was really interesting. It was wonderful to hear and to just talk about and everybody was, again, bonded, those who were mothers, 
bonded over that experience, right? And again, the process was really important. And luckily in this case, we did capture the songs and they're available on a CD, which goes to, you know, so anyhow, it, they're out there if you take a look in, on Spotify or other platforms, which I know are problematic, but they're out there. And uh, again, it was a, a kind of a way of theorizing through songs and so that I call sung theories. Very cool. Um, I think we may have come to the end of our session. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Lika, Marta, thank you so much for taking part in Popular Music Books in Process. Um, thanks to all the, the folks who are hung out with us today. Um, Alex Ross and Kira Thurman are here next week to talk about Wagner, and um, we'll see how that all goes. We have a thank you. This is an amazing project from Gus Stadler coming in on the feed and lots of other warm comments that I will pass along um, from those who marveled at the whole process along the way. So. Um, again, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And thank you, Micaela, once again, for, for taking the time to be here with us. All right. <laughs> uh, you two hang out. I'm going to pause it, but bye-bye.